Hello, my friends. Nick Labretti here for the Long Ash Podcast. And today we have a very special episode. Joining me today is someone who, oddly enough, I'm not sure how many of you out there have heard his name, but he is one of the more influential people in the cigar industry because of his, you know, because of his occupation, because of his position. Um, he is just a total class act. And I'm not saying this just because he's my boss, by the way. He is Italian class personified. He is the CEO of JR Cigars. Please give your big round of applause, your virtual round of applause to Davide Moro. Davide, thank you so thank much for you. joining us today. I cannot basically say anything else after your introduction. No. It's fantastic. I appreciate it. <laughs> that's the, that's the good very part about the show. I do I do most of the talking, so I, I got it. <laughs> I don't shut up actually. Uh -huh. So, Davide, you've had a really interesting journey to the cigar industry. Um, you see a lot of people who are are higher up um, in the cigar industry. They come from some kind of family legacy or even a, a cigar retail background. But you came from another background. Um, but a major one. Tell us a little bit about you know your your kind of job history, if you will, and your journey that brought you to JR. Sure. Um, well, I think we can. I can summarize it first. I think I basically I'm in this industry because I worked a long time in coffee. Okay. And there is a, there is a lot of uh, similarity between coffee and uh, and tobacco when it comes to. Uh, farming practices when it comes to um, also the the taste. I mean, mm. they're different things, but yeah. there is a passion around the two products. But more broadly, I have, uh, yes, I don't come from the cigar industry. I come from the food and beverage industry. I worked a long time in Nestle or Nestle. I don't know how people... <laughs> yeah, Nestle, that's, uh, that's how okay. us, us yeah. garbage Americans pronounce no, it. No, garbage <laughs> at all. And... Um, yeah, so yeah, 20, 20 years with the, with with the, with Nestle working in different uh, places. Uh, started off in Italy and then ended up in uh, Mexico and then in the United States, um, where I spent the last uh, now thirteen years of our life, mine and my family. First in Los Angeles, where I was uh, running um, the Nescafe business for North America, uh -huh. and then um, most recently. Uh, in Nespresso, running the marketing program. So an Italian yeah. who worked in the coffee, and your family must have been very proud. <laughs> My family was was happy to, to yeah. have some coffee. Exactly, and, exactly. Yeah, and they were very proud. What was, yeah. uh, so you've, you've, you've also had this interesting life of being able to live in, you know, around the world, obviously coming from Italy, living in Mexico, and living in two different parts of this country that I think culturally are also very different. What was one of your favorite places that you got to live? Um, every place really has... It's uniqueness. I think um, Mexico is definitely one place because mm. that's where I met my wife, mm. and um, also because um, it's uh, it's a place where in a day you go through a roller coaster. Many yeah. things happen from good to bad, and when you when you are when you finish your day, you're never mm. bored. Right. <laughs> Let's put it this way: it's a very young country. I think. Um, about 70% of the population or so is below 30 years old. Um, and so very strong energy. And then um, after, uh, I would say Los Angeles, because, you know, this is where our kids were born. Mm. So I have sentimental attachments exactly. to these places. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Where was the best food, though? Besides Italy. We're going to just say Italy counts as a thing. It's, easy. it's yeah. an easy pick. It's yeah, an it easy is. pick. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so... You've you've been working with us now for since before COVID. I want to say 2019 is when you came on board. Correct. What were your first impressions of the cigar industry when you started working and you started seeing the, the inner workings? What kind of inspired you in the cigar industry? What did you think that you could bring different to the industry from your your very yeah. experienced background? Well, I think um, this is an industry where the majority of the people come from within. And mm. um, so I thought that maybe coming from outside, I would be able to provide some freshness in terms of um, uh, some, you know, some things we can unlock with consumers. Mm. Um, because if there is one truth is that the, the category you're working with, yes, it is important, but should not dictate 
some general truth that you mm. need to um, observe. Right. First of all, um, the service you provide and the quality you provide. And so, yes, you need to know the consumers. Yes, you need to know the cigars, I wanted to say, actually. But, um, you know, we are mainly an, an e-commerce organization. So mm. I focus more on the aspects of the business more than the product when I came in. Of course, while I was learning about right. the product. And, and it's fun learning about the products in this industry. Fun. Absolutely. I love it. I love yeah. it. And uh, But I'm not an expert. Right. No? I mean, I'm getting better. Yeah, absolutely. Especially at smoking them. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, no, I think my focus has been more on the... Uh, on the pure business aspects, um, learning a lot from the consumers, um, understanding what they want and when they want it and, and trying to be uh, better than competition in doing that as much as we can. Well, listen, I, I think, and there's, there's a lot of us here who, you know, uh, a nice breath of fresh air, um, especially from us who kind of are the, the, the marketing team, somebody with such an experience in marketing, it was great to see some of your ideas, how they've been implemented, and also the freedom you've given a lot of us. I mean, like, this studio really probably wouldn't be possible under somebody else. Uh, the 50th anniversary that we did, you know, we you had you were all on board for that, and that turned out very successful. What, um, this is going to be a simple question, but because you're relatively new still in terms of smoking, what are some of the, the brands that you really have fi found yourself, like, attached to? Like, oh, I actually really like smoking this a lot. Well... I would say I was very surprised with the um, positively with the Monte Cristo um, 50th anniversary. I thought mm. that was a phenomenal cigar. Um, the Hopman uh, remind me the date 19 the, the 175th nine, oh yeah, exactly phenomenal cigar. This mm. this was the, my my introduction basically to the right. company, and so they they still are amongst my favorite. Mm. Um, and then uh, I would say, um, you know, of course, I like to smoke also competition. Though. You shouldn't right. just smoke uh, what the mother company is is doing, uh, which is Altaris for us, mm -hmm. as everybody knows. And uh, and there I don't want to pinpoint cigars and make enemies. But I, I really like, um, I like surprises. Uh, I like cigars that maybe are boutique brands. Mm. Yeah. So. It, it is fun when I give you, uh, you ask me for like a fun cigar and I give you something. I'm like, there's no way he's ever like, like this is just going to be a really weird cigar for him to enjoy. And then you'll be like, Hey, whatever that was, that was amazing. That was a yeah. great one. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it is cool to kind of, yes. um, because, and I think it's because while you might, have, you might not have been a cigar smoker for, you know, 30 years, but because of your background in something like coffee, you can, you find the appreciation, mm -hmm in a, a lot of different avenues of the product rather than just like, oh, the immediate taste is good. It's like you can tell the construction is good. You right. can tell if it's smooth, if it's aged. So that brings us to the big topic of today's uh, show. So this is coming out Thursday night. So by today, you would have seen the launch of our latest private label. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's one of our best. And this is coming from the guy who worked on all the 50th ones. So I'm yes. not saying this lightly. Uh, I think this is one of the best products to bear the JR name, and this mm. was kind of your brainchild. So today we're talking about and smoking yes. the JR Pure Origin Gran Volcano. Yes. Take me through the steps because I, I for months, I had heard like whispers like, oh, Davide's working on like a secret. It's like a secret big project that's going to be amazing. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about, because this, this is in terms of the idea of this project this was basically your your yeah. your baby tell us a little bit about what that process was like what gave you the idea to do a project like this well first of all um it, it came through conversations also with uh, with javier um because we 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 both knew that jr is an established brand as a retailer hmm. but we also know jr has infinite experience in the making of cigars mm. through the partnerships, through uh, the private labels and through our, our line of JR alternatives as well. No, mm. And therefore, um, what um, we and I say now the team, including yourself, mm. we wanted to do is to elevate the JR brand and bring to consumers what we can do. Mm. And, um, you know, JR alternatives are definitely more affordable cigars versus others. Mm. This would represent the very first uh, premium cigar within the JR brands. And that was the goal. But it wasn't just thought to be a, 
an expensive cigar. We wanted to match, of course, a, a superior quality. Right. And um, and so what we what we thought about is to develop an umbrella first of all, not just a story of a single cigar, but something that we can actually perpetuate in time, so that um, we continuously um, delight our consumers with new um, varieties under the same umbrella brand, which right. is Pure Origins, right? So that was that was the idea. It's nothing necessarily new. I mean, many brands already do that. But um, our idea was to is to look for, I would call, remote areas mm -hmm. where tobacco is grown. And uh, uh, similar projects were developed uh, when I was working at Nespresso. So I was mm -hmm. inspired by, by my previous experiences as well. And um, so the promise that we want to uh, maintain with consumers and, and, and deliver is that we go to make the extra mile, the extra effort to get the tobacco from areas where it is difficult to grow mm. for either their um, exactly in the location they are, the, the tobacco is grown or uh, even the parts of the world, right. right? Where it's grown. So, you know, the, the first one is is coming from Nicaragua, so it's a very well established uh, 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 region. Mm -hmm. But um, but we went to a very specific area, which is an island, Ometepe, mm -hmm. where there are two volcanoes, one of which is active, and uh, I mean other blends were created there. We're mm -hmm. not the first one, and uh, with the Placencia family, we specifically asked to not only go and get the cigar from this particular place, which is peculiar in terms of the soil, the richness, mm -hmm. the minerals, and the, the fact that the cigar has a nice balance between complexity and keeping a constant and balanced profile, right. and also the sweetness that the soil provides, right? So this is uh, hopefully the first of uh, a long series, and right. that, was, that was the idea not in a nutshell, I suppose, because I yeah. <laughs> kind of took my time to explain it. <laughs> in an eggshell. Right? In an eggshell, yeah. exactly, exactly. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, th I, I mean, I worked with you when you know you you had kind of laid out the story. I just you know for the for the writing for the mm -hmm. magazine, whatever, and the way you explained it, um, and the way that we you 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 kind of came to this story. I mean, listen, this every cigar brand has a story. Yes. Some of them are true. Some of them are. Be yeah, you can tell they just slapped something on there. But what's cool about this is uh, what's what's interesting about it is that mm -hmm. the story is true, and it like it's not. There's no way to fabricate it. It's like the tobacco is coming from a volcanic island, mm -hmm. and it's a known volcanic island. You didn't make something up. It's not the El Dorado. Um, so, and what's interesting about the cigar industry um, and the growing process in general is you can do a lot of these versions because there's so many places mm -hmm. that grow i don't want to call it one off but a very limited amount in a remote area or an area that's difficult to import and export out of exactly. um, there's places in africa there's places in asia and then going with the placencia family i'm like you, know, you can't go wrong absolutely with that. can't so what we're looking at in terms of a blend here is you have it's i believe it's a nicaraguan puro you have tobaccos from ometepe for the filler and i believe the binder and then what really attracts me, though, besides the packaging, which we're going to get to, the reddish wrapper here from, mm -hmm. uh, I believe it's from Yalapa. It's very aged. It is, and it looks beautiful. I love, yeah. it's It's called um, Colorado. Yep. Is like So, a, as I'm sure you're, you're learning, the cigar industry, in terms of the terminology, can be very confusing because <laughs> there's a lot of things that can be translated by different people to mean different things. So, right. before, really, the internet, where people are getting much more informed about the product, about the seed varieties and all that. Cigars were mostly just described by the color that they were. Yes. So Colorado, Oscuro, Maduro, these were just basically like how you would describe the different variations. Um, but Colorado always, to me, how I was taught, always means like a, a rocky reddish hue to it. And that's what I see here in this, this stunning wrapper. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Um, it's very smooth, but it has a ton of flavor. It has that tobacco sweetness that you're going to get from Yalapa, but also an interesting, richer sweetness from that Ometepe tobacco. Decent amount of spice I'm getting on the palate. Yes. And the construction, 
is just, I mean, this is my third one in like a week and each one, I mean, I showed you the picture. The last one I had the ash down oh, yeah, here. It's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. So, so let's talk a little bit about the, the packaging here. And so we, we should also mention who also is behind this, which is Rafael Nadal. Oh, the great right? Rafael Nadal. The great yeah. Rafael Nadal who with, with, with me, with us, he, he crafted the, the cigar and together with the La Ciencia family. You know, he's a very passionate man, as everybody knows, and um, we owe him a big thank you because this cigar took a lot of uh, uh, consistency, um, perseverance, mm -hmm. because, um, you know, uh, we had to wait until it aged before mm -hmm. really assessing the quality. And in the beginning, I wasn't really sure. Right. And he told me, wait, wait. This is gonna only get better. That's a that's and a proven, but that that's what makes Raphael special Absolutely. is that there are guys who, even you have the date set and you have yeah. all the marketing lined up, and he's like, it's not ready. Very, I've heard a few times. I know Ernesto Perez Carrillo has done that once or twice, where he's like, it's not mm -hmm. ready. We thought it was gonna mm -hmm. be ready, and it's mm -hmm. not. And then every time that that cigar, when it finally is released. It always is something yeah. extra special because like they, they took the, if it was just a one-off, like it's a $5 cigar, release it whenever. But when they put a lot of heart and passion and work yes. into it, they want it to be released at the, at the full potential of the blend. Mm -hmm. And I remember we was just a few months ago where we're like, yeah, we got to hold off. Raphael's like there, mm -hmm. you guys were talking. He's like, it's not ready yet. We yeah. got to, we got to let it sit. Um, he's also a man who is very familiar with Ometepe tobacco. Um, one of his cigars that he did was the, uh, which I believe also he worked with Placenti on, was the Aging Room Bin Number no. Two, mm -hmm. which for me up until this was the pinnacle of using Omatastic cigar. Fantastic cigar. That and the Placencia uh, Alma Fuego um, also uses it uh, a little bit. But yeah, they, they, I mean, you have two of the masters there, and Rafael and Nestor Placencia yes. from the most, most legendary family. So, but even before I get into the packaging, you decided to you you wanted this to be a JR brand. Mm -hmm. You wanted to elevate JR. Tell us a little bit about where you where you want to see the JR brand now and in the future. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, <clears throat> JR has two key priorities: service and product. Mm -hmm. Okay, because ultimately we are a service company. Mm -hmm. uh, we're about delivering cigars on time at the right price. So always getting better at that is number one priority. And I have to answer like that, not mm -hmm. just with product in mind, because this is who we are. Right. Um, but at the same time, we all know that um, the cigar industry is, 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 through, is going through a premiumization. Mm. Premiumization doesn't mean that it becomes inaccessible but it means that consumers are becoming more and more savvy about what they're smoking and they're willing to pay an extra dollar or whatever it is to have what they really want. And mm -hmm. so JR is going as a brand of cigars going in that direction. And, uh, you know, we, we are not about just selling cheap and fresh. We're really evolving from what used to be the DNA of the company mm -hmm. into uh, a making of the cigar. And so, our idea is, of course, to keep our uh, our consumers happy with what they like. But I am absolutely convinced that um, our, um, for example, JR Alternative um, 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 uh, loyal consumers would love this cigar. Yeah. Would love this cigar. Not only them, okay? But I think this cigar was made in recognition of their loyalty, okay? We have a large base of uh, consumers who already like and believe in the JR brand as a, as a maker of cigars. And so this cigar was made with them in mind, first of all, but definitely this is the quality of the cigar, I think could even go beyond selling it within JR. Right. I mean, I don't see why JR could not be found uh, outside of our system, okay? And if a, if a cigar is really well done and is appreciated by consumers, there are no boundaries. And that, if you ask me what will be my dream, is that this cigar will be bought by what we consider our competitors today. But a good cigar is a good cigar. So that's actually, <laughs> think about consumers, it. That's a, the consumers will dictate it. Yeah. Not, not us. That's a great tagline for this cigar. Mm -hmm. JR Pure Origin, no boundaries. Mm -hmm. 
that's why he writes all this stuff. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about the packaging and, and, and with the packaging, the, the blend, the idea mm -hmm. and going into what you just said, you know me, I got a big mouth. I always speak my mind. And even from my time in the retail store, whether it's our competitors, whether it's I've always, I'm, I'm just critical of things that I think deserve to be critiqued. Mm -hmm. And when I was told of this project that you were working on, he's like, he wants to make it. It's going to be a JR branded thing, but it's going to be high end. I'm like, it's not going to work like the JR logo. It's just not going to fit. And like, and then we saw the first mock-up images of what the box looked like, what the band looked like. And I'm like, all right, this could work. And then we got the first samples in and I'm like, this isn't bad because you, you had been raving about it. Mm -hmm. And then you smoked those, those samples that we got in. You're like, oh no, this isn't it. This isn't like, this is not right. And that's when Raphael said, no, we got to wait. Yep. Then I smoked the final product just a few weeks ago. And I'm like, I don't know how he did this. <laughs> I don't know what magic they were working. To, I've been saying for years, oh, the JR brand, it's tough because it's just, it's just so ingrained in, in me because I worked here, but in a lot of customers as just the fast, fresh and cheap, the bargain, mm -hmm. not the company as a whole, but in terms of things that bear the, like products that bear the logo, mm -hmm. that's always just kind of how it's been seen. I think this is going to drastically change that. Um, so... First of all, you you won me over, and I'm a Thank tough you. I'm a tough yeah. cookie. Yeah, yeah. I'm a yeah. tough biscotti. So you, you are, you yeah. are, you are. But you and you have easily like won me over. That's great. So tell us a little bit about mm -hmm. um, the kind of direction you went in the packaging. I mean, it's a beautiful. I open my cigar down, even though I don't want to. Beautiful white box here. Yes. You got the JR logo. Do you have? Is there like any meaning behind like? the sphere or yeah. does it just look look no, nice? No, the sphere in itself doesn't have a real meaning, but the the color coding does. I mean, we are coming out with a with a blue stripe now. Mm -hmm. And um, when we're going to actually go out with different uh, um, pure origins, mm -hmm. there will be different colors, but it will still be recognizable on a, right. on a white, completely recyclable packaging. I want to say that. Um, the, the, another crucial point of this uh uh, project is to make the whole thing recyclable, okay? right? Because we want to be environmentally conscious, and uh, and so the the idea was to keep it simple. Uh, the, the the white is um, simply to um, to reflect the the idea of being pure origin. Mm -hmm. And by the way, by pure origin, I don't want we don't want to confuse the consumers. It's not that it's one blend. Mm -hmm. It's the fact that we're going into places in the world where tobacco was grown first. Right. Okay. The, the, the origins of, of cigars. That's the meaning of the name pure origins. Right. Okay. And so the white, the white color reflects a bit that, I mean, the, the, the word pure. Right. And then um, soon we're going to see other, other, other varieties and uh, people are going to be surprised where we're going to go and do this. We, we had <laughs> talked about a, few, about a few cool places um, uh, in terms of, I mean, like, like we said before, there's Africa, there's Asia, there's, there's a lot of mm -hmm. really interesting. And even, like, even this, you didn't necessarily have to go too far outside of the cigar norm it was a place in Nicaragua, which is the largest producer sure. of, of cigars for the United States at this point. But you didn't just go to some massive farm somewhere. You went to very specific, no. like you were able to find it in there. And that's what I think is going to interest a lot of people yes. is that Nicaraguans are a pretty regular staple, but we're, you're still able to bring them a unique experience exactly. within, within that realm, exactly. which I think is is awesome. Yes. Um, when you were traveling, when you worked in you, you said you got a little bit of this inspiration from your time uh, working in, in the coffee industry. What was that like? Like, where did you, where, where were some of these remote places you got, got to travel or you guys worked on when you were working for Nespresso? Well, um, one, one of the most recent projects um, was in uh, Puerto Rico. But, okay. um, but the, 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 without speaking too much about now coffee and mm -hmm. uh, other companies, um, there was an intent there to revive some coffee farms that okay. either for, uh, so the concept was a bit different. It was about bringing it back. Right. Okay. And um, because of either um, environmental um, problems a country has gone through, like hurricanes, for example, mm. or uh, economic ones, right? Right. 
And, um, but also, so that's one place, but then of course, Colombia is a place where mm. you have one of the best coffees ever. But Nespresso is a phenomenal brand in bringing you exactly something similar to this. Uh, yeah. Coffees from Africa, coffees from Asia, coffees from a very different parts of the world. And um, they really know how to do it. Okay. And so, you know, I, I haven't been to Asia, but I've been to some, some of the places in, in Latin America and where I could see exactly what we're trying to do here. Um, right. You could kind of see, yeah. even before you knew that there was going to be a plan, you could see a plan for Like there's something exactly. here. Exactly. There's something here. Exactly. Exactly. So tell me, what coffee do you think would pair best with the Pure Origin? What kind of roast or, you know, mm -hmm. hazelnut, cream, sugar? Like what kind of, uh, I know that as an Italian, that probably pains you. Well, without giving any lecture, but mm. the uh, um, coffees are mainly divided into um, we have uh, Arabica blends and also Robusta. Robusta are um, a bit more bitter mm. um, um, and, and strong, whereas the um, Arabica are more acidic. And, um, you know, most of the times the Arabica are the better blends. Mm. Um, so there isn't a recipe, but mm. I would I would tend, I would lean towards an, 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 an Arabica, mm -hmm. a coffee that isn't too strong, because this way you can really um, emphasize the sweetness of, of the cigar that really comes through all along the experience of smoking it, right? And mm -hmm. actually the sweetness, it, it's a bit more pronounced towards the end. It's not overly sweet at all, mm -hmm. but you wouldn't want a coffee that is too strong and too bitter to offset that experience. So I will go with something mellow. And also the same would apply to a drink. Right. You know? I will go with a nice aged rum but one of those rounded rum right. that is not too where it, it has the, not, not the a whiskey for it. right it has the rum sweetness but it's not Correct. one of these like yes. 10 dollar yeah. bottles super sweet no, just exactly. for for younger exactly. people i mm -hmm. I, I understand yes, that yes, um without giving away too much information i'm sure it's still a work in progress i'm sure there's still yes. conversations going on do you have a place in mind for the next pure origin it's set no it's set yeah but uh, as you said we want it to be a surprise. Okay. Um, it's, uh, it's, I can say it's a location where um, there is a tradition of cigars, mm -hmm. but I would bet that not even half of the people would know it. Okay. So would I know it? You'd, you probably would, but you wouldn't mm -hmm. know maybe the details. Okay. And therefore, um, it's going to be one of those uh, experiences that is going to be interesting. And when 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 are we uh, working uh, next summer? You know, how, well that's that's a kind of a, I guess a, a broader question. Is this something you see as a seasonal release? Is it something that you see as like we'll always be making the Grand Volcano and then we'll always be making the next one as well? Like we're going to constantly have them, or is it once Grand Volcano is done, you'll never see it again? You'll see the next one. How do you kind of envision the brand going forward? Yes, I envision exactly what you said. We envision unless there is a. Uh, an overwhelming demand for uh, for one particular um, cigar. We, of course, are going to be able to produce it again. But the idea is to go to treat it as uh, as limited editions mm. and to have at least one cigar a year, okay. uh, one different variety a year. Right. So next year, we're planning to launch it before the summer period. Yes. All right. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm very excited. Yes. Before I let you go, David, I have one one more coffee question, just from one Italian to another, because it's always been a big debate with me and my friends. When you're walking through Italy, or even even parts of uh, of Latin America, even even when we were in Miami, and you stop at a local place to get an espresso, are you putting sugar in that? And if so, how many? Never. Never. Never sugar. Never a whitener. I mean, I, on an, I wouldn't use a whitener on an espresso. Like if I'm getting like just a little shot, but I'll, I'll put in a sugar or two. Nope. No, me. Well, <laughs> I, when you know it's bad, you have to. Yeah. Okay. When it's overly bitter, you want it. But, but if you're walking through the streets of Milan and you're just going to a mm, local place and getting an no, espresso, you're just getting it straight. No. Well, sometimes, believe it or not, in the, in the bars of Milan, the quality of the coffees is not as good as you may think. I mean, the okay. cost, well, the, 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 the coffee is is, is different. It's, mm. it's shorter. It's thicker, um, and you do realize without putting adding sugar, 
how burnt it is or not because oh, okay. these machines are all used a lot yeah. okay so i would think that most italians put a little bit of spoon because they are used to have this bitter kick and right. therefore depending where i am in italy sometimes i do add sugar okay. a little bit of sugar but otherwise the best the purest way to drink a coffee is without sugar. Believe it or not, 65% of Americans put one sort of whitener in their coffee. I mean, I, I, and, I, I want and, my, for my American coffee, I'm always putting in, this is how bad, I'll get the Reese's peanut butter creamer. <laughs> like, I'll get the worst white trash thing to put in there. Uh, but if I'm going to a really good Italian restaurant or if I'm in Little Italy yeah. in the city or if I'm in um, Little Havana, like when me and Greg went there last year, um, and you're just going to a, a 50 year old corner place that has Cuban sandwiches yeah. and like a big espresso machine. I'll, I'll still put in a little sugar, but, but I'm not putting in any kind of cream or anything. I'm yeah. just, I'm yeah. serving that bad boy back. A little tiny bit of sugar is, yeah. is, is, is good when you do it just enough to take away the bitterness. Right, exactly. But if it's to have a sweetness, overwhelming sweetness in your mouth, then. You're not really drinking coffee, you know, um, but that's my opinion. We're gonna have to do a like a mini show on here. We're gonna have to do coffee <laughs> picks with Davide, where he's gonna yeah. explain a different coffee and cigar pairing each time. Exactly. Well, Davide, this has been an, uh, awesome. I think uh, our I think our fans are really gonna react to this well. I mean, this the CEO of a company like this. I mean, like we talked about, a lot of cigar companies have faces but then usually when it comes to these big you know a, a larger one like us sometimes those faces can get lost in the shuffle but you are not only incredibly passionate about the product but you're incredibly passionate about our customers and want to do right by them so i thought it was important to get you in front of the camera you. introduce you and also you have put so much work behind this brand and listen if i thought the thing was garbage you wouldn't be on the show I was Thank as, you. as i know you're my boss but i'm like i can't have garbage on this show <laughs> so it just shows you this is uh excellent uh, and for just a couple years in the cigar industry, like you're awesome. You're doing a Thank great you job. Thank so much. So oh. guys, it's available right now. So uh, make sure to check it out. The JR Pure Origin Gran Volcano. Thank you very much for watching. Make sure to comment, like, and subscribe. And as always, keep them lit.